Next, the chamber would like to give the floor to Mr. Kilson Pond to continue his statement. The accused. Thank you, Mr. President. I would like to continue my statement. Before the break, I stop at point B, which is about the, the time when I was a parliamentary member and later on was the Secretary of State of the Ministry of Commerce. In 1962, I was elected the parliamentary member during the Sankumri Niyum, which was a movement created by Sandak Narodam Sihanu. During the general election in 1955, I was appointed the Secretary of State of the Ministry of Commerce immediately after that. Your Honours, the exact intent of Sandai Tsiyanu was to buy my heart. But I took that opportunity to work for his interest and also for the interest of the country. I did not forget my plan to reform the economy so that there was a foundation for an independent national economy. When I was working for the Lazo Vector, I usually discussed with senior officials whose who have proper policies. Those people included His Excellency Sun San, who was the uh, director of the National Bank, His Excellency Mi Kun Pratian, the chief of the Royal Cooperative with the French acronym OROC, and some Dai Painot senior advisors to Sandak Nirodam Siano, etc., in order to study about the possibility that these people would support my plan. My appointment as a Secretary of State of the Ministry of Commerce gave me the opportunity to have chains of discussions with his Excellency Sir San about my plan. At the time, His Excellency was also worried about foreign, foreign currencies being stolen to sell in the dark market, and that would bring the value of the real down. Those who believed that they were industrialists came to ask for money from the Ministry of Commerce, claiming that they needed that money in order to buy some factory equipment, some spare parts, some other natural resources for their factories. But it was only an excuse. In fact, they needed that money to buy a foreign, to buy currencies from the dark markets. The 
exchange rate was that um, 30 reals was for one dollars US dollars but the value of real the value of dollars was up to 200 real in the dark market so the selling of dollars in the dark market earned a lot of profits that is the reason why the dark market spread I informed his Excellency third son that such a context connected closely with our economy and that that illegal activities were in place were possible because there was involvement of our banks. However, it was not possible for us to con take control over the activities, no matter how hard we tried to do so. The reason was that the import and export companies, both in Cambodia and in foreign countries, belong to only one owner or a group of owners. It could be compared to two pockets of the same person, of the same shirt, rather. The company in Cambodia always lost their profits or earned very minimal profits, while the foreign company in a foreign country always earned profits. It was like there was no money in the left pocket, but there was always money in the right pocket. But actually, the trader with these two pockets always earn something. Such activities could be eliminated or can or could be minimized if the government were able to take control over the foreign trade concerning important productions including rice, corns, rubbers, and to take control over banks with foreign trade cooperations. After our many discussions, His Excellency Sun San agreed with me. He suggested that I came up with a reform plan and submitted that plan to me so that he could forward it to some Dyke Sienu. As for some Dyke Noram Sienu, he was also concerned that Cambodia became very submissive to the America. While America always threatened to cut aid. In this sense, the American aid were like a knife put at the necks of Cambodians. My proposal was satisf satisfied by the king. Unfortunately, I lost my parliamentary seat due to the high price of the beef. It was a joke, actually. And a lot of uh, Cambodian elders who were 60 years old and about could remember me very well.
the name of the treadman in Rome was the one who actually made me lose my seat during the song Kum Ri Niyum. That was the name of the person in Rome. I did not believe that some Dutch here knew, did not know that it was the trick to get me rid of the seat because he also believes that majority of the Cambodian people did not eat beef every day, but they consume fish on a daily basis. In fact, the king himself needed to get rid of me so that I would lose my political gain as I was the initiator of the reform process. And so that the people would believe that I was the Khmerus, that I was a bad communist who did not have the ability, and that I only criticized the Sangkum Rith Niyum. To back that up, the reform process based on my proposal was achieving great result. In the first one or two years before it went sour because of the corruption. Though I lost my seat, I was happy that some like Sun San or His Excellency Sun San was appointed by the king to continue with the economic reform as I proposed. Since 1955, that's the balance sheet with the foreign trade maintains its balance that is the payment balance, the external payment balance sheet. And in 1965, and a year after, the balance sheet maintains its position. During the same period, the currency reserved at the National Bank increased. C. Reasons that I fled into the forest in 1967 It's stated in paragraphs 1128 and 1600 of the closing order. The reason that I fled to the forest is that I was forced to. Personally, I wanted to continue my work as the parliamentarian representative, but I had no other choice besides fleeing from Phnom Penh because my safety could not be guaranteed. I was threatened to be arrested and brought to the military court under the pretext that I was the ringleader of the Peasants' rebellious activities in some load. In fact, I did not even know where some load was at that time. And of course, I did not believe that the Peasants' Rebellion 
was due to the incitement that I was allegedly made in my newspaper because those persons could not read French. The truth is that since after the 1965 election, some that Sihanou convinced by his by the his rightist of the Lunol's clique, who were also part of the Americans was around it, and that he was mainly focused on the establishment of liaison with America. For that reason, he attacked the, the leftist. And based on that, Ludnall attacked the rest and he made the arrest at his own will. And that led to my allegation. And that I was accused in broad daylight as well as a number of threats against myself. As a result, I became an expensive commodity for the Communist Party of Kampuchea. The fact that I forced myself to flee Phnom Penh was a good opportunity for them so that I could be brought along with them. D. After the 1970 coup d'etat, paragraphs 25 and 1129 of the closing order, I would like to provide details regarding the organizations of the United Front of Cambodia and the Royal Government for National Reconciliation of Cambodia, in particular in regards to the appeal made on the 23rd of March 1970 by Samdai Sihanou. In fact, the appeal was not entirely written by the king. His proposal was given to Mr. Chu En Lai, who was the first premier of China, and Chu En Lai presented to Salat Sol. Salazzo made some changes. In particular, he removed the parts concerned the socialism. However, Salazzo did not go and meet Sianu as requested by Chu En Lai. However, instead, he wrote a letter to support the personalities, the high personalities, including my name, Hu Yun, Hu Nam. And he said that the letter was sent from a base of a resistance inside the country. 
CNO was not informed that at that time Salazar was still in Beijing. I myself, at that time, I was at the Oral Mountain. That was the headquarter of Tamok, together with Hu Yun, Hoi Nim, and Pok De Kok Ma. I heard the appeals by King Sianu and the declarations of organization of the United Government was through the listening to the broadcast only. And in that the in that United Government I was appointed by Salazzo as the Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of Defense. I only heard all this information only via the radio broadcast. Allow me to bring another important event to you. One, the reason Pol Pot refused to meet with King Sianu is that he was the secretary of the Communist Party of Cambodia, which was the Peasants' Party, the party for the workers, in order to struggle to defeat the feudalist regime where King Sienu was the leader. For that reason, he would not be able to go and pay respect to King Sienu. Nor he would come under the leadership of the king. Point number two, the king himself, who was the reign of the territory, who was the king's father, who was the king of the nation, his position is above everyone else. So he had to be the leader of the United Front. It can be viewed that the obstacle or the barrier between the two could not be removed. For that reason, I was tasked to be a bridge between the CPK and the king in order to pave the way for the reconciliation of all the forces throughout the world, regardless of their political tendencies or belief, to form a struggle to liberate the country which was under the flame of war by Vietnam, post the coup d'etat by Lunol. Is that a crime? Of course it is not. Clearly it is not. In addition, as I stated earlier, it is clear that it was Pol Pot who appointed me to hold the positions that I was not even aware of 
that is uh, Deputy Prime Minister, uh, Prime Minister of Defense of Nothing, or the Military Commander of Nothing. It was then the CPK who led the struggle since the militia in the guerrilla war in 1968-69 until the proper division of war in 1970-1975. Based on this, though they still allege that I have the superior power for this or for that? Of course not. It's not possible. If I was only a deputy prime minister for nothing or the minister of defense for nothing or the military commander for nothing, how could I have the power? In fact, I had no influence whatsoever for the military. I did not even have a smallest unit of soldiers under my command. On the contrary, I sacrificed my profession, my honor, so that I could perform tasks for my motherland, which suffered greatly. At that time, my feeling, my feeling was similar to that mentioned by Noon Chi on Monday the 5th of December. I would not allow my country, which only gained independence from the French grip, and that it would clearly be liberated from the Americans in the near future, but likely to fall in the hand of the with of the communist vietnam i'd like now to touch upon my role in the party that is the communist party of campuchia A. Becoming a member of the CPK. In up to 1969, and at the Phnom Aural Mountain, I joined the party with Hu Yun, Hui Nam, Pok De Koma, where Tamok on behalf of the CPK introduced us. In the first of the CPK, my membership in the French Communist Party means nothing because the conditions in the CPK here were more stricter than that in the French Communist Party. Namely, one, we must be active in combat and must have gone through experience in the struggles movement of the revolution repeatedly. Number two, I must have a clean social status. Personally, I did not have a clean social status because I was a senior intellectual. I studied in France. 
uh, clean social status referred only to the patients and not just any patient. It refers to the poor patient class. Even through my refashioning, my engagement in the revolutionary movement repeatedly was only one of the conditions. So, as a result, I did not fulfill the true criteria. In addition, I did not join the struggle with my own belief. It was only because I had to force myself to do so due to my personal safety. So I fled and came and seek assistance under the CPK leadership. I did not volunteer to abandon my parliamentary seat voluntarily. I was forced to. This is not what we call participation in the re revolutionary struggle. And that point is the main point that was marked constantly in my personal biography. B. Becoming a member of the Central Committee, paragraphs 29 and paragraph 1130 of the closing order. I became a candidate member of the Central Committee in 1971. As a candidate member, I did not have the right to make any decision. The fact that I was allowed to become a candidate member of the Central Committee is that because I had the task of acting as a bridge to liaise between the CPK and King Sihanou. Therefore, they needed to show to the people that I was a leader of the resistance inside the country. And if I was only an ordinary member, it would be unlikely for that reason. So, they promoted me, they promoted me to a certain extent in order to protect my image in the party. For that reason, Pol Pot and the CPK still considered me as a front person, not a person belonging to the party. Let me give you a real example. All other members of the Central Party were given the responsibility to be in charge of a zone, a sector, or major units, for example, divisions. I myself was also a member of the Central, Central Party, but I was only tasked in writing reports frequently to some type CNO.
So my role and my status within the CPK was similar to that of the Vietnamese people of the National Front to liberate the South of Vietnam, namely Nguyen Hu Tho and Vân Tan Phat. Mr. Nguyen Hu Tho was a famous lawyer in Pre No Go, and he was the chairman of the South Vietnam National Liberation Front. Mr. Vân Tan Phat was an engineer and was the first premier of the provisional revolutionary government of the South Vietnam. However, after the liberation of South Vietnam, the two disappeared forever. Another issue that I would like to mention here is concerned paragraph 1129 of the closing order it states that after the topple of some that Nordam in 1970 and when the National United Front of Campuchia was established. Khe Som Pon participated with Pol Pot, Nguyen Chia, and other leaders of the Communist Party in the headquarters of the parties. This is not correct. Because it was not me because I was not in the group of the CPK and it was not me who came to stay at the party headquarters. It was Pol Pot who called upon me to go there in order to participate and to listen to what he did with the military cadre from various battles, various battlefields, who came to report to him and to listen to him how he gave directions back to those people so that I could understand the situation of the revolutions so that they could write up a report to the Sumdak Sienu. In this regard, I hope that Mr. President and your owners, ladies and gentlemen who are present here, venerable monks and my fellow citizens, understand clearly, see clearly, with no doubt about my role and status within the CPK, especially to understand what Pol Pot did with regards to my appointment since the time we were in Beijing he, since the time he was in Beijing and when I was at Oral Mountain he wrote a letter on my behalf that I supported the United Front of Cambodia of some like Sienu. I was appointed as a deputy prime minister of nothing, the minister of defense of nothing, the commander of forces of nothing. 
I was not even aware of that myself. So I'd understand. I was seen from the outside that I was holding a senior position. But I did not participate in any decision making processes. And all for this, Pol Pot and the CPK considered me as an intellectual. Who came to live with the CPK and I was not a person belonging to the party. This is the truth before 1975 and it remained to be the case after that year. However, this issue will have to be examined further in subsequent trials. Before I conclude my speech, if it please the court, would like to move on to talk about another issue. It is of my view that I need to explain why the majority of Cambodian supported the struggle movements under the leadership of the CPK. From what I understand, because those people were hopeless about the Lunol regime, a corrupt regime who was a slave of the America. But if you looked at the movement itself, those people were clean people who protect the independence and sovereignty of the nation. Those people were tired of the cruelty, crimes and anarchic activities during the Lunald time. They have heard that there was strict discipline in the struggle movements, but they were prepared to abide by those restrictions. That was because they were hungry for a society with moral and clean behaviors. Mr. President, your honors, ladies and gentlemen who are present here, venerable monks, my fellow citizens, I have informed you all about what I want to say today. Thank you. Mr. President, thank you for your statements with very comprehensive descriptions, Mr. Kevzampon. And it is now appropriate for us to adjourn for today's session. But before this, the Chamber would like to inform the parties and the public, as well as the Office of Administration of the ECCC, who are tasked to provide administrative support to the Chamber that the chamber intends to continue the hearings to hear testimony of the accused on Friday 16 morning. In this regard, all concerned parties and units should be informed of this. And it is now time for us to adjourn for today's session and we will continue our hearing tomorrow morning from 9 o'clock detention
personnel are now instructed to bring the three accused back to the detention facility and return them to courtroom tomorrow morning by 9 o'clock. The court is now adjourned.